Hey there, Brandon Harvey here. Before we get started with this week's episode, I just wanted to jump in and say it has been so fun seeing so many people's responses to issue three of the Good News paper showing up in mailboxes, on front porches, getting out there in the world. If you ordered the Good Newspaper, we want to see more photos, so send them our way. And if you haven't ordered the Good Newspaper yet, we'd love for you to pick one up. You can order it at shop.goodgoodgood.co. And uh, the stories, we hope that they leave you feeling hopeful, but more than that, we hope that they leave you feeling inspired to take action, to become a part of the good in the world. Because there's a lot of good in the world, and we have the opportunity to be a part of it shop.goodgoodgood.co. We can't wait for you to read it. Now, here we go with this week's episode. So I was recently doing some research on the percentage of Americans living with chronic illness and came across some unbelievable numbers. The CDC says that as of 2012, about half of all adults, 117 million people, had one or more chronic health conditions. According to the National Health Council, by 2020, it is projected that 157 million Americans will live with some sort of ongoing chronic disease or illness. And that's just wild. It makes me think that someone listening to this podcast today will have encountered or interacted with someone experiencing a type of chronic illness. And this makes me think of this quote by Plato where he says, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a great battle. My guest today, award-winning writer Esme Wang, fights a daily battle. She knows from personal experience how tough it is to live with ambition and deal with limitation. Esme is an essayist and a novelist who lives daily with chronic illness, including late-stage Lyme disease and schizoaffective disorder. Despite this reality that she lives with every single day, she was named by Granta as one of the best young American novelists in 2017, which is just amazing. Her story is important, and I think you're going to be moved by it because I've been moved by it ever since I first found her on Instagram. I am Brandon Harvey, and this is Sounds Good, the weekly podcast where we have conversations with inspiring people who are rejecting cynicism and using their lives to make an impact. So without any further ado, let's jump straight into this conversation. So Esme, when did you first begin to write? I first began to write when I was a little kid, um, before I even could write letters and things like that. I would just kind of write these, draw these jagged lines in notebooks and fill notebooks with jagged lines and tell people that I was writing a book or a story because I, I didn't actually know how to do that. But then as I got a little bit older, um, I started writing stories, binding them into books. I knew from a very young age that being a writer was something that I really wanted to do and authors really fascinated me. I subscribed to Writer's Market or Writer's Digest, actually, um, when I was, I think, nine years old. I had a copy of the Market Guide for Young Writers. Wow. Which, yeah, existed, I think, in the yeah in the 90s, in the early 90s, for kids who wanted to find places to publish. And I knew all about, like, self-addressed stamped envelopes and how you could submit. You know, I wrote Little Brown and a letter when I was six years old asking how I could get published by Little Brown. And they did write me back, which was kind of amazing. I, I imagine it was probably an intern or some other friendly human who wrote back to the six-year-old, but um, I remember them saying, well, you might want to get an agent, <laughs> which I didn't <laughs> manage to do for many more years. But yes, I've, I've kind of always wanted to be a writer, even though there have been detours along my path in terms of, you know, jobs that I thought I would take or career paths I thought I would go down that had nothing to do with writing. So that's always been there though. That's incredible. I love that this wasn't something that you maybe forgot about and you came back to like so many people, but really you kind of stuck around with it for a long time. And it makes me curious though, because a lot of kids, they want to grow up to be other things, things that aren't writers. What kind of like role models or inspiration did you have as a kid to want to pursue this? Well, that's a really interesting question because I feel like 
I didn't really have role models. Um, part of, I think, being a child of immigrants is that often we're encouraged to do these really practical things because that's why our parents came to this country so that we could have a better life and thus become doctors or lawyers and make money and be stable. And being a writer is certainly not financially stable. So actually, my parents really kept me away from the idea of being an artist or writer of any kind. I never met, really met anybody um, outside of school assemblies who did art or writing for a living. They really encouraged me to do something practical. And so I think what really served me as opposed to like a, a mentor, like somebody who I knew was a writer was just reading books and imagining the worlds that the writers of these books lived in and wondering how did these people get to make these amazing things between these covers. That's incredible. I love that that was driven by a sense of curiosity more than a sense of knowing, you know, more than yeah. knowing somebody who had already done this. Yeah. Do you think that you were most drawn to the process of writing or what was the core part within writing that you think you were especially drawn to? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think part of it was, yeah, always having a notebook with me, always writing. So that part of it was very much with me and something that I really loved. I remember filling these notebooks when I was very young, like seven or eight with these little vignettes describing like the way the water looks in the swimming pool when the light hits it a certain way and just filling notebooks with these little descriptions and character sketches. And just, I, I have no idea where I really got this from, but I, I knew that that was what I wanted to do. And so I, that kind of writing or that part of writing is something that I'm actually doing right now as I'm beginning to work on my second novel. But I think also the idea of having a book and seeing the completed product of books when I went to the store or when I could convince my parents to take me to the bookstore it was also really enticing. So yeah, both the journey and the destination for me. I want to definitely talk about your book that you're working on because it sounds really exciting. But before that, I would love to talk a little bit about uh, your newest book, The Border of Paradise. Tell me about the process of writing this book. What was that like for you? So it started when I was in graduate school. I was in the MFA program for fiction at the University of Michigan, and I just started working on the novel there. A lot of other students were also working on novels. And this one, I think in part because I was just learning to write a novel. I didn't, I'd never done it before. I didn't really know what the process was like. So it took a while. I think it took about five or six years to write this book. And then once I'd written it, there became the whole question of like, how is this going to get published? Is it going to get published? At the time, I had many friends who were getting six-figure deals for their books. I had a friend who was offered $500,000 for two books. Um, it was a very um, exciting time to have these friends who were publishing books. But I was also extremely worried because my book was rejected. In the end, my book was rejected 41 times. What? <laughs> wow. It was, it was so horrifying to me because I, as I said, I had these friends who like their books sold within 48 hours or they got these like huge deals. And here I was with my sad little manuscript, not knowing if it would ever get published because it just kept going out to editors and going out to editors and re being rejected over and over again. What was the thought process like as you were receiving these rejection letters? Because you were proud enough to start submitting it, but I can imagine a sense of doubt starts creeping in. Yeah, it was really sad. Um, the thing is, a lot of those rejection letters were very nice ones. They were like, oh, this is close, but it's a little too bleak. That was a thing that kept coming back was that the book was a little too dark, a little too bleak. Um, and I just had an immense amount of faith in the book, but it's also hard to have that unshakable faith when you're getting rejected over and over again by like the, some of the most prestigious publishers in the country. Um, and so I, you know, was told by my agent at the time, uh, I'm not with that person anymore. Um, but my agent said, I think 
like, this is done. Like, we're done with this. I'm not sending it out anymore. And, you know, you can work on something new and then we can try to sell it again when you have this new thing. And so it almost seems like this book was going to become like a, what they call a drawer book, like a book you put in the drawer and shut away. And then it was just kind of floating around sitting in my computer and I sent it out to one press, one small press called Unnamed that a friend of mine had just done an interview with for Publishers Weekly. And so I sent it to them without an agent because my agent was done with it. And they wrote back and said, we'd like to publish this. What? So <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, it was kind of like my last ditch effort and it ended up working out. And, and it's so interesting to me now that Border of Paradise, um, you know, was like an NPR best book of 2016. It was, it was really successful, of, it yeah, seems. Yeah, it was one of Electric Literature's best novels of this publication Granta does a list of the best of young American novelists every 10 years. And so they did it in 2017 and I was on the list. What? Wow. I didn't see that. It's yeah. incredible. Yeah. And so for this book though, and you know, there were other people on the list, people like Lauren Groff who had like published several books. And so they were being kind of assessed for their whole body of work, but it was amazing to think that this little book that almost died on the vine, like found a life and a home somewhere. And I'm always, I'm forever grateful to Chris Heiser and Olivia Taylor Smith at Unnamed for picking up my book because I don't know, I don't know what it would have happened if that hadn't worked out. I just got goosebumps. Like, that's so cool. <laughs> um, your book, it's fiction, but in some ways, it seems that it, it mirrors your own life a little bit. Is that at all true? And if so, how? I think it's funny when people ask about this because the main narrator in the beginning is like a white Polish man in the 40s. And the story is about, in part, also about an immigrant who's from Kaohsiung and then also like, you know, was the daughter of like what was essentially a brothel, like the owner of a brothel. And, you know, and there's like incest and stuff like it that. It makes so me people, just sound terrible. Yeah. So when people <laughs> ask me that, I'm just kind of like, well, I mean, do you really think that like all of that stuff is yeah. from my life? I'm but sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. It's interesting though, because for me, in order to write, there has to be some kernel of my own life in there and my own self in there. So that's like the fun and sneaky thing about fiction writing, I think. So one thing that I heard a lot actually was, how did you write? So just for people who haven't read the book, which is I'm sure many people, um, The Border of Paradise is written in seven points of view. So you get it all. Um, and there was one section written from the point of view of the white Polish man. And he, at this point, he has two children. And I heard from people on social media, like, how does this writer write about having children in a way that resonates with me so strongly as a parent? And yet she does not have children and like never plans on having, I never plan on having children. And so that, that kind of stuff is interesting to me because the way I did write those parts about being a parent and being the parent of, biracial children, like, again, something I've never done. But that all came from like, an experience of mine that was similar, plus like imagination. So that's how that happened. Do you feel like a part of that sense of imagination comes from a sense of empathy? I almost feel like I get that impression. Yeah, like I really care about empathy and I think compassion is extremely important, especially in these dire times. We haven't t mentioned this, but I started becoming really sick, chronically ill in 2014. And after that, well, no, earlier than that, like 2013, 2012. And since then, I have felt a kind of transition into like becoming more compassionate or feeling more compassion, which is not to to my own horn, but it also like refers for me to something Sarah Mangusa wrote once, I think in her book, The Two Kinds of Decay, which is also about her illness, but it was something like having a severe or chronic illness either makes you into a total asshole or it makes you more compassionate. Um, and so for a time, like 
immediately in the darkest parts of my illness, I would find myself becoming more compassionate because I realized that anybody can become disabled. Anybody can become chronically ill at basically any time. And so when you're out and about and maybe you're annoyed with people or whatever, you really don't know what they're dealing with. And so that became kind of a mantra to me. It's like you you never know what battle other people are fighting. Yeah. I mean, truly for the first, you know, 10 minutes of this conversation, you wouldn't know that you struggle daily with chronic illness. And I think that's maybe a testament to how many people in our lives maybe we don't know are, are dealing with things. And that's something that I've admired about you from afar, just getting to know you on Instagram and Twitter where I've been following you. And I do see that sense of compassion seeping through. And I think that that's maybe a common thread between so many people who struggle with chronic illness or chronic pain or similar life experiences is the compassion side of things can really bleed into the work that people produce. Not to say that people should go out and, and become chronically ill, but I can see it in your work and it's I deeply admire that. Thank you. Like I think a, a more concrete example of this is so in the border of paradise, there's the mother figure, her name who is called Ma. And when I first wrote the first draft of this book, she was just kind of a scary inexplicable woman who was doing kind of cruel and terrible things. And you weren't really sure why she just seemed kind of awful. And then I remember turning in my thesis, which was about a hundred pages and not from her point of view, although she was in it. And a professor told me like, this is really interesting, but like, how did she become who she is in this section? Like how does Ma become like this? Because people in general, like, I don't know if I believe in the whole like psychopathy and sociopaths and things like that, but like how, other than that, outside of that kind of thing, like how did she become like this? And so that became my job was to write all the parts before that thesis part, that 100 pages, like how did Ma, where was she living? Where did she come from in Taiwan? How did she become so obsessed with her family that she ended up doing these terrible things? that are described in the book. Like, and so that encouraged for me a kind of like empathy towards the characters in the book, these imaginary characters. It comes back to this idea of curiosity. It, it seems like you kind of leaned into saying, okay, what could have created somebody to respond in this way? And, you know, getting to know that it, it's helpful that you get to decide because you're the author, but um, it's interesting thinking about how we can also apply that to our lives. Yeah, for sure. Um, I have another just like very brief anecdote that yeah, has please. to do with the book. But yeah, so this is one I, I tell sometimes, which is um, I was very, very ill. I had just come from a neurology appointment and I just had 17 vials of blood drawn and they thought I might have cancer, something like related to the brain, some terrible autoimmune thing. And so they had these supplements that they wanted me to get and I could only get them at Whole Foods. And so my husband, Chris, and I went to Whole Foods and we didn't normally go there. That wasn't somewhere we normally shopped, but we were there to get those supplements. And so we went, picked up the supplements. And so we're, we were walking toward the checkout area, the cashiers, and I saw Chris just like bump into somebody. It was somebody coming in the opposite direction toward me because I was behind Chris. And I saw the person just like give him this really dirty look, like, how could you bump into me? Like, and so rude, like you didn't even apologize. And I was just overwhelmed with this feeling of, I don't know, compassion and sadness because my husband is someone who is so thoughtful. He's the one who has to stop me from like barging into an <laughs> elevator um, when the elevator doors open, you know, you have to let other people out first, but I'm like, time to go in the elevator. <laughs> um, but, you know, he he's so thoughtful and sweet. And I was thinking like, sir, you know, with this person you Chris bumped into, like, I don't know you and you don't know us, but like, I just want you to know we're going through a really hard time. And like, you know, this was going on in my head. I was just saying this in my head. I was like, we're going through a really hard time and he doesn't normally act like this. And he didn't even notice he bumped into you and he, he would have apologized if he had noticed. He just has a lot on his mind right now. And then I started thinking, okay, well, what about this man? Like, maybe he like just lost his job today. Like maybe he 
can't afford anything at Whole Foods, but he comes like every week just to like look at the cheese and pretend he can buy this really expensive cheese or something. And um, so I wrote a blog post about that. It was it was an open letter. It was like for the man who bumped into my husband at Whole Foods or whatever, um, who my husband bumped into at Whole Foods. And then I posted it on my blog and then like 10 minutes later, I was reading a comment and there was it was from a woman who said, I'm reading this and like essentially like crying in the parking lot of a Whole Foods. And I'm going to keep this in mind when I go in and shop today. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So that's like another kind of like compassion, like practice. Or- yeah, that's incredible. And you said that, that you were diagnosed with chronic illness in 2014. Yeah. So I'd been diagnosed with like chronic mental illness. It, it, the division is kind of weird, but yeah, I was diagnosed with chronic mental illness when I was about 14 or 15, but then I was diagnosed with these more kind of these more serious physical issues in And what were they if you don't mind me asking? The the physical? Yes. Yeah, so it's been really confusing, but I think right now it's mostly late stage Lyme disease which has wreaked havoc on all kinds of other systems of my body, just like my autonomic nervous system is all messed up from the Lyme. And so I have also dysautonomia, which is just a fancy way of saying my autonomic nervous system doesn't work right. Yeah. And just so that has caused a lot of difficulty. I deal with like daily intense and chronic fatigue. Um, I have dysautonomic crashes, which are just these flares where I have fever and I'm dealing with various things basically every month. And so, yeah, life has really changed and I've had to adapt a lot. And I think one of the most difficult parts of having had this change in my physical ability is that I've always been such an ambitious person and have had so many dreams and wanted to do so many things. And yet having this physical illness imposes very real limitations on myself. And so it's part of the the quest that I've been on recently and also the quest that I bring to my business, my small online business, The Unexpected Shape, is to ask like, how can I be an ambitious person while living with limitations? And so that's stuff I write about on the blog. I've made products and taught classes and workshops about like ass kicking with limitations and various things, because I feel like this is something that's not just my issue. I, I've spoken to many other people dealing with the same thing. And I love that you've specifically turned outward. I think that so many times, especially chronic illnesses and, and those that people can't see, I think they kind of cause us to turn inward, you know, maybe validly so, but you've been able to basically say, okay, there's other people who maybe are seeking to be ambitious while dealing with limitations. How can I help them from my experience? You know, and and you have been able to find some success within that. You know, your book obviously came out in the midst of all of this. What are you learning? You know, how can somebody with limitations continue their ambition and not let it slow them down or, or at least not stop them? I think a really big thing for me that I love to talk about um, in particular in my Ask a King with Limitations class is this idea of boundaries. So everybody has boundaries in their lives, but we tend to look at boundaries as things that should be broken, like time to break the boundaries or like the sky's the limit and stuff like that. Um, But the problem is, or the issue is that like people with chronic illness have very real boundaries and limitations. And actually, so do people who don't have chronic illness. They just, you know, either don't acknowledge them and just drink like five more cups of coffee or they, you know, run their bodies into the ground um, and then end up really ill later with like some kind of heart problem or something. But um, I like to think about is, and I think this is from, uh, I think his name is Peter North, um, a professor. Um, of English who talked about, uh, so I'm not like a huge baseball fan, but this get ready for a sports analogy. So I'm not like necessarily a huge sports person either. So I'm excited to go through this with you. Yeah. So the idea is that like life, if you look at it as a game or like as baseball, like baseball has boundaries. Like you've got like a baseball diamond. If you're a batter, you hit the ball and then you run like around the bases in a given order. Like, and you can 
even if you get a home run, you can only run from first to second to third to home run. Like you can't just like run directly to the, to home plate, you know, like, uh, and so I kind of think of living with limitations that way. It's like, we all love to like run from like first base to like home plate or, or, or maybe even run all the way around like five times, but like, that's just not how the game is set up. And even if the game were set up in a way where you could do that, it wouldn't be like enjoyable because you would be able to do whatever the hell you wanted to do. And that's not how games work. Like the reason games are interesting is that there are those limitations in place. So that's kind of how I try to explain it. Do you think that it's about acknowledging the limitations and the boundaries that you already have? Or is it about defining them for yourself? You know what I mean? Like, are they already there or is it something that we create? Well, we all have both, I think, like we have boundaries that we create that are, you know, often largely psychological that have to do with like our upbringing and like our parents and the, our culture and where we live and what country we live in, et cetera, et cetera. And then there are limitations that are um, ones that we probably have to acknowledge. Like I, I have had to acknowledge that I need a lot of time in bed, just like not doing anything um, and allowing my body to rest or acknowledging that if I go to like a big loud party, I'm probably going to crash and not be very physically capable for, you know, a number of days or even have like a bad fever or something like that for a number of days afterward. So I think it's both. Um, And also just like a quick note, I think that it's important to mention that boundaries that are psychological are ones that we have somehow created by being raised in a certain way or, or traumas that have happened to us or whatnot, like they're not any less quote unquote real than the ones that are physiological. Like I, it really bothers me when people use that kind of language or talk about things that have been related to mental issues in that way. Like I was just talking to a friend about how trauma is so often linked to the illness fibromyalgia But just because fibromyalgia often happens to people with trauma doesn't mean that like it's not a real pain in your nerves and like pain in your joints and like fatigue. It also reminds me of like a Fiona Apple lyric that I really like. That's um, he said, it's all in your head. And I said, so is everything. But he didn't get it. That's beautiful. I love how referential you are. It's it's really It makes me really happy that you're able to pull in such diverse, you know, Fiona Apple and (laughs) a sports metaphor. Like it's, it's wonderful. Uh, I mean, yeah, I've spent a lot of time thinking about these things. Thank you. (laughs) On your website, I know that you talk about how you've begun, you know, in the process of learning how to continue being ambitious while dealing with limitations. You've began to focus on creativity resilience and legacy. Can you break that down a little bit for me? I love that. Like I remember seeing that on your site and just kind of like whispering to myself like, yes, that's amazing. (laughs) Yeah. So for me personally, and for a lot of people, the work that they do in the world is creative in some way. So you're, you know, to me, creative is defined by like, if you're making something, if you're creating something that's creative. Um, And the resilience part is really just addressing how important it is for us as humans to acknowledge that that illness comes into our lives and we like to pretend it doesn't but illness comes into our lives and tragedy comes into our lives and people we love die and we need to take care of children who might get sick um we have children we might not have children um but in life, resilience is a part is a, is a big part of that. Like it's very important to exercise that muscle and to develop resilience in whatever way we can, in my opinion. And then the legacy part is just um, I love thinking about how do we impact others and what do we leave behind when we die. And there have been so many you know, things written by various people, usually dudes, Um, (laughs) uh, um, like the book Die Empty or whatever, just like the idea. I mean, you know, I do like a lot of these ideas, but I find the bro-y way in which they're written to be kind of off-putting. Yeah. But that's something I think about a lot is like, what would my obituary say? Like, and not only what would my obituary say, but like, what would the people I love most say about me? 
And on a day-to-day basis in terms of legacy, I also think, again, of impact. So legacy for me can be just like being nice to the barista when you get coffee because that barista deals with a lot of shit every day and probably has dealt with a lot by the time you get up to her in the line or them in the line. I especially love that idea at the end of, you know, maybe legacy not being tied to your name. You know, it's you being kind to a barista is never going to make it into your obituary. I feel like there's something really powerful about, not that it's secretive, but the stuff done in a sense of anonymity, just because, you know, you're leaving a legacy in that person's life on a small scale. I think that's, we have so many more opportunities to do those little things every day than we have to do the big things. You know, you, you wrote a book, uh, and you know, it'll still be a while before that next book comes out. And in between book number one and book number two, there's so much space to build your legacy outside of those big things. And, you know, for people who don't get to write books or who don't get to, you know, do these things that are seen by a lot of people, I feel like that idea is really refreshing. And I I like that you brought that up. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, I really believe that. So tell me a little bit about this new book that you're working on. This is exciting. Yeah. So this book is coming out February 5th, 2019. So we have a little bit of time. Wow. That feels so far away. (laughs) Uh, But you'll be here before you know it. I mean, it'll be here before I know it. But um, it's uh, a book published by Grey Wolf called The Collected Schizophrenias. And it's an essay collection about schizophrenia which is something that I started writing about after I was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder in 2014, 2015, something. So so somewhere around there. And so, yeah, I've been just kind of writing about that. Some of the essays have been published. A lot of them haven't. I really care about this book. So for a number of reasons. One, like I feel like the discussion about mental health issues and mental illness has been really vibrant lately. And, you know, I was actually listening to your episode with Sammy Nichols and it made me really happy. Oh yeah. She's Um, great. Yeah. Yeah. Just listening to discussions about like being more open about these issues. And, um, you know, I love her hashtag talking about it. I think for me, one thing that I do want to help speed along a little bit more is this conversation about quote unquote, more serious mental illnesses that don't get talked about in this way. So, You know, I feel like lately it's been more accepted to say like I have depression or I have anxiety. But like if you say I have schizophrenia or like I've been experiencing psychosis, then you might get a little bit of a more weird look from somebody. There's kind of an invisible tier system of acceptability still. Yeah, exactly. And I write about this in my book. Like there's I feel like almost like a hierarchy of mental illness um, where people will say like, well, you can have depression and like completely continue to be a CEO of a company or whatever. But if you're, if you have schizophrenia, then like you're obviously just going to be living on the streets and you won't be able to do anything. Um, And so I feel like a lot of literature has contributed to that. I think that there are a lot of really well-meaning people who write about people they know with schizophrenia and that's great in a lot of ways, but it's, it's missing something like Ellen Sachs wrote the book, the center cannot hold. And I really appreciated that because she's writing about her own experience with schizophrenia. And so I'm writing from an interesting place where I'm, I have schizoaffective disorder. I am also fairly high functioning, especially for somebody with a form of schizophrenia. Um, And so I felt like writing this book was really important to help people learn you know, what does it mean to be psychotic? Like, what does it mean to have a a form of the schizophrenia? It's also not just about me. Like I talk about how do people treat people with schizophrenia in colleges? Like, how does the administration deal with that? Um, Stories about violence. Um, I wrote an essay about a man who was murdered by his uh, sister and mother because they were scared of him. He had schizophrenia and they didn't know how to deal with him. And they ended up shooting him like in the middle of the night on a deserted road and they dumped him to the side of the road and left. And so, yeah, there are all these stories that I want to tell and wanted to tell. And I just turned in one of the final drafts of the book. It should be finished soon. So yeah, that's, that's what I'm, I've been working on for the last year or so, but also just it's been really wonderful for me to have 
had written a book while being sick because it reminded me or not reminded me, but it let me know that I could do it. It was possible to write a book while sick. I love this idea that you were able to, you know, bring this book to fruition because you knew you had done it before. And it comes back to that idea of resilience. And then the book itself is, you know, I think it's going to be impactful. I think that comes back to this idea of of legacy. And I guess I'll just bring it back all the way and say that obviously creativity goes into that. But with this book and in this conversation you're trying to have, I'm curious, what is your hope for what the future looks like for people who have some form of schizophrenia. What does the world look like for people because of the effect of this book? This is such a good question, and it's a question that I have such difficulty answering because in my book, I kind of wrestle. I'm wrestling, like, back, and I go back and forth, and I think about and write about being high-functioning and what does that mean, and, like, am I hoping that, like, the world will be full of just like high functioning schizophrenics or am I, am I hoping for like, I mean, I'm definitely hoping for better treatment, but am I hoping for better treatment that is not obligated? Like, like currently there are all kinds of laws in all kinds of places where there's forced treatment. So like involuntary treatment. So I've been involuntarily hospitalized three times now, but, uh, you know, that's not something that I, I think is good, but I, but I go back and forth, you know, sometimes I think maybe involuntary hospitalization can be useful. And I think that's in part what makes my book a little bit different is like, I, I am in no way I feel capable or even maybe interested in answering these very difficult questions. What I want to do is present the reader with like all of this stuff and then say, okay, you decide what you think. I think that's a really incredible place to be coming from. I think that that's going to spark a sense of curiosity in in a lot of other people. I know that it it sparks a sense of curiosity that I didn't already have. And then we all get to answer those questions together. We get to work together to figure out what we can do to make the world better, which uh, that sounds so cheesy at the very end, uh, but I think it's true. Yeah, yeah. I love the idea of more conversations happening and You know, I like the idea of I've been contacted by doctors and nurses and people who work in psychiatry and psychology and in therapeutic areas. And they're like, oh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to reading this because I work with these types of patients um, all day and I want to know how best to help them. I'm not saying that my book is like a manual that's going to help them like step one, step two, but I think and I hope a lot in there to feed this very thirsty, hungry um, community and world that needs to think more about things like schizophrenia and the very vulnerable parts of our population. Yeah, you're creating something that's not already out there. Is it hard to put that down on paper or does it feel, is it hard for you to put that out in the world? It seems intimate. Oh my gosh, yeah. It was so different from writing The Border of Paradise. Like I I felt like writing some parts of this book were so traumatic and just immersing myself in reading about all the terrible things various people have gone through or been through. And it's very different. Like I I feel like writing this book was more traumatic than writing The Border of Paradise. And to be honest, like I cannot wait to write fiction again. And I'm I'm going to be working on a new, new novel this year. But I'm glad I did it. Like it was hard, but I think it was worth it. And I really look forward to people reading this book once it's out. That's really good. Well, I'm excited about this. I can't wait for 2019. I have so much admiration for you and I love what you're doing. And I love the way that you are able to accomplish so much despite the obstacles in your path. And I know that a lot of other people do too. For people who are listening to this and, you know, they're thinking about the limitations in their life and, you know, they've got this sense of ambition and they want to create things that matter and they want to have an impact on other people. What's a practical, tangible action step that they can take, you know, in their day to day or maybe even this week that can kind of help them follow in this same path that you've continued to walk down? Yeah. So one idea might be, to look at a limitation and 
you know, probably the limitation will seem very large when you write it down or think about it. I would recommend writing it down if you can. But, you know, say you write like fatigue is like a big limitation of yours because you, you know, have some kind of illness that involves fatigue. And then to under that, just kind of think about like, okay, what like very concrete consequences does fatigue have on the things I want to do? So like for me, an example would be fatigue makes it hard for me to sit at a computer and work when I want to write. So that's like one very like concrete way that that limitation shows itself. So then the next step would be what is kind of like a twist I can put on that some kind of solution or like a a hack almost that I can do. And so what I've come up with there is I write for like 10 minutes spurts and I do it on my phone on an app and I just tap and I just tap. Actually, I wrote like probably over 90% of this second book on my phone. Or That's like incredible. Phone. Yeah. Just like tapping with one finger <laughs> like <laughs> on this notes app because or drafts app because I, I can't sit up for long periods of time and it's hard for me to, to be um, at a desk and at a laptop. So yeah, just try to find one hack you know, just one hack to like one part of one of your limitations. That would be my suggestion. I'm so inspired and challenged by the way that Esme shows up in the world. Remember what Esme suggests. The next time you experience limitation, write it down. And then think about the very concrete consequences that this limitation has on the things you want to do. Then ask yourself, What is a kind of solution that I can move towards with ambition? And then ask yourself, what is a kind of solution that I can move toward? Living with ambition despite my limitation. I absolutely want to practice this as well. If you aren't already following Esme on social media, please do. Do it. I love her on Instagram and I love her on Twitter. And you can also learn way more about her on her website and her blog. Her blog is amazing. That's where she dives deep into this idea of living with ambition despite limitations. Her blog is called The Unexpected Shape. And of course, you can order her newest book, The Border of Paradise, online or at your local bookstore. If you're new to Sounds Good, we'd love for you to stick around. If you connected with this conversation, you'd also probably love our conversations with Sammy Nichols and hip-hop artist Propaganda. This podcast is created by me, Brandon Harvey, as a part of Good Good Good, a community that believes in the power of celebrating good news and becoming good news. Chad Michael Snavely and the team at CM Studio edit and mix the show, and Christy Karen Brock offers production support. You can get lots of hopeful stories on social media by following us everywhere at, at Good 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 Co. That's Good 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 C O. We love getting to know you all on social media. And one of the best places we're able to do that is on Twitter. And most of all, we love when people tweet at us with good news stories that inspire them. It's one of our favorite ways to learn and spread good news. And so tweet us. We'd love to hear from you. And on that note, that is a wrap for this week's episode. Go out and do some good this week. And we'll be back next week with another inspiring story from an incredible person. Sound good?